Can you afford the luxury of a small home NAS server while operating off of batteries and solar power? Yes, you probably can if the server runs off of 12 volts DC and only uses about 12 watts of power. In this video intended for hardware and solar enthusiasts, I will show you how I built a small and silent terabyte NAS server for my home network with a mix of used and new hardware. I needed a place to store my files and so it was time to get the job done. What is a home server or NAS good for? It can bring all digital assets together in one place, storing documents, music, videos, software, drivers, user manuals, and automatic data backups of everything. Then they can be accessed by any computer on the home network. And if one of your computers crashes and the right software is installed on the NAS server, you can restore that computer from backup like nothing ever happened. And you can do that yourself without paying anyone. Plus, the server can run hundreds of applications and keep everything backed up freeing you from paying cloud storage fees and giving freedom and independence. The cloud can fail at any time. Many providers don't even guarantee your data is backed up. I don't trust third-party cloud services. For many years, I've been my own storage and application service provider. A DIY cloud is a good idea. Let's start with the main requirements I had for this NAS server build. First, the server needs to be compact and low voltage DC powered. It must have low power consumption. This is great for environments that are off the electrical grid and using solar power and battery banks. I wanted my NAS server to have no fans or fan noise, so that means passive cooling only. It will have no moving parts, so solid state drives will be used for storage. I want a clean looking build with minimal wires inside. Yes, I like my computers to look nice. It should be able to run Linux or Windows and have at least one gigabit of network speed. A low power mini ITX motherboard is a great way to build your own custom NAS server, but it's not without challenges. I still prefer it versus buying proprietary NAS devices that lack upgrade paths and flexibility. Those devices have their own advantages, so it's worth doing a lot of research before getting your own NAS. Let's get on to the hardware. I like to collect unusual PC and server hardware. For this build, I purchased a used mini ITX embedded motherboard for about $40 on eBay. It is one of my all-time favorites, the rare EMB-CV1. It was built by industrial manufacturer Aeon, which has ties to Asus. What makes this board kind of unusual is the customized layout intended for industrial applications. It has GPIO, LVD, and serial headers. Generally, this kind of motherboard would be custom made for an OEM and not sold to the general public. This board would be considered outdated by the world at large, but I like to repurpose and work with older hardware, giving it a second life. What some consider outdated technology is a treasure to me. Processing is handled by a dual-core Intel Atom D2550 CPU clocked at 1.86 GHz with a dissipation of 10 watts. Atom is the name Intel gave their low-power CPU product, which is directly soldered onto the motherboard. The earliest ones were launched around 2008. These processors are used in netbooks, phones, tablets, and motherboards where power efficiency is desired more than performance. The chipset is the Intel NM10. It's a piece of history straight out of the year 2012, but it still works great. The board is 6.7 inches square, which is standard mini ITX form factor. There is no audio chip fitted, which means power savings. I don't need sound anyway. To start the build, I blasted out most of the dust using my air compressor. I got this board used off of eBay, and it had a fair amount of dust in it. I didn't get all of it, but it's enough to start the build. If you've priced many ITX cases lately, you will find that many of them are really overpriced. This case is a bit banged up from its prior existence, but it's good enough for the purpose and I'm going to use it. As this is a small form factor case, it's not very roomy, but it's roomier than some of the ones I've seen. And it also has poor ventilation, but I may work on that some more later. One of the reasons why I chose this board is that it has very nice Realtek 8111E Gigabit NIC ports integrated. These are very easy to find drivers for. If I team them up, I'll have a 2 gigabit network interface, and I could also use one of these boards as a firewall platform. Video output is only VGA and DVI, but I'm building a server here and not a desktop, so that's more than good enough. 
I don't like to waste anything around here, so I tested the coin cell on the motherboard and found that it was still good enough for now. As with any used motherboard that you don't know where it came from or what happened to it, it's sometimes a good idea to check the 12 volt rails and the other rails that are on the board to see if they are shorted or if there's anything wrong with them. High impedance means the board passes the test. Here I'm also checking the 5 volt rail which is at the SATA power. Unfortunately this motherboard does not have the SATA power connector fitted and I addressed that on one of my other builds. Perhaps I'll do a video about that later. For memory, I installed 8 gigabytes of DDR3 SODIMM memory. They are used parts from eBay, but they work just fine. If I was concerned, I could always run MemTest86 to test the stability of the memory, but I chose to skip that step. With the memory seated firmly, I can now look at storage. In order to build any kind of home server or NAS, I need to have somewhere to install an operating system to control it. Unfortunately, this particular board is stripped down and does not have physical SATA connections. It does, however, have a mini PCI Express slot, which is wired directly to the SATA bus. I will take advantage of that by installing at least one used mSATA SSD to host the operating system. Next, after making sure the case was clean, I installed the motherboard onto the standoffs and attached the front panel wires inside. Since I did not feel like soldering physical SATA ports onto the board, onto the spaces provided, I decided to find a workaround. And that is simply to use this dual M2 SATA board from Sedna. It uses a PCI Express X1 slot and it has an integrated as media SATA controller for two ports. Eventually this server will host over 4 to 8 terabytes of data, but to start out I have these 1 terabyte M2 SATA SSDs that I'm going to give a try. I had a suspicion these M2 SSDs would get hot and I was right. They did. So in the future I will probably stick to standard SATA SSDs. With the two 1 terabyte M2 SSDs loaded, this Sedna board fits neatly in the PCI Express X1 slot. I like this board because there are no cables to manage, there's no power cables, there's no SATA cables, and there's no cable management at all. Just snap the board in and install one screw and you're done. Actually, by the time this build is done, there's basically nothing in the case. It's one of the most barren looking builds I've ever done. But that is what I like. Clean, neat, and minimal wires going all over the place. On second thought, it's a little bit too barren. How about a 50 cent RGB LED mod? Yeah, that should enhance the performance quite a bit. I don't know what it is about RGB LEDs, but yeah, I just can't stay away. This server is so efficient it uses 11.5 to 12 watts at idle and can run off of 12 volts DC directly. And that's with the capability to have multiple terabytes of storage installed. For old technology from 2012, that's not bad. Okay, now that I've put the NAS server together, I need to install an operating system that will control it. Building your own home NAS server means you get to choose the software. There are lots of off-the-shelf home NAS server devices that can be purchased. There are so many different ones to pick from and they're usually pretty easy to get working out of the box. But those come with a lot of limitations placed by the manufacturer usually, and I want to have complete control over my device. I want all my files to be presented on the network, and I don't want to have anything hidden behind a dashboard that I don't know how it works or can't access. So for me that means I will have to choose and install my own operating system from scratch. Now the very common and very popular option these days is called FreeNAS or TrueNAS and that's very very flexible and very very powerful. But it doesn't meet my requirements so I'm not going to use it. There are plenty of videos already made about how to install TrueNAS if you want to go that direction. This video is going to be specific to my build and because I work in the information technology industry and I use both Windows Server and Linux I chose to go with Windows Server. And because I like to take a trip down memory lane and use vintage software, I'm going to use the Windows Server 2008 operating system. It is tremendously powerful and flexible, and there's nothing you can't do with it if you know what you're doing. And even as a simple NAS server, it really shines. This video would get too long if I made it about Windows Server, so I'm just going to do a really quick overview. Windows Server is very easy to install because underneath it's a lot like Windows 7. The downside of using an older operating system is that you need to be an IT expert and know how to secure your systems so that you don't have security vulnerabilities or viruses or whatnot floating around on your network. Believe it or not, just about any Windows operating system can function as a NAS because file sharing is one of the most simple and basic services that is built into the Windows operating system. So if you wanted to, you could make a NAS server using a copy of Windows 10 or Windows 11. It really doesn't matter. As long as it can share a folder over the network, it can be a NAS server. Here's a little bit of the reasoning why I chose Windows Server to build my NAS with. 
Windows Server has several benefits that make it very, very friendly to use. First, it looks just like a desktop operating system. Second, it has a built-in management console, which has all of the different settings and functions of the server, and it makes it very easy to add and remove features and control the server from one location. Once I had the operating system installed, I proceeded to download all the drivers and software I needed to make the system work. The most basic feature of a NAS is to present storage to networked computers, so I need to share a folder. Windows file sharing is one of the easiest things to use. First, I need to make a folder. Then I will right-click the folder and go to Properties. Then I can click the Share button, select a user who is going to have access to the files, and I click the Share button and I'm done. I really like the way this works. It's very easy to use and very simple. Accessing the shared folder from a Windows computer is slightly more complicated, but it really isn't that bad. I just right-click on the network icon on my desktop computer. I select Map Network Drive, and I select a drive letter and enter in the credentials of the user that I use to share the folder that is on the server. Then I just click finish and now I have a drive layer in my computer icon which is going to allow me to access that folder and copy files to and from it anytime I want to. And because this is a Windows Server operating system, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of applications and features and services that I can install on this machine to do anything I want to do. To me, making backups is one of the most important and critical reasons why I need a NAS server. So I install free backup software on my desktop computers as well as the NAS server itself. This software makes a complete backup image of the hard drive on my servers and desktop computers and stores it in a shared folder. To provide additional security, my server has two SSDs and one backs up to the other one automatically. This ensures complete data security. The server protects itself as well as all of the computers on my network. And best of all, it doesn't cost me anything. I don't have to pay any monthly fees or pay for any cloud services. It's my data and my server, and it's under my complete control. And if I want to change something or try new software, I can do anything I want to do. I don't want this video to get too long, so I'm going to cut it here. If you're interested in learning more about how to use free software to back up your entire network, let me know. I can certainly do a video about that. If there's anything you feel was not covered in this video that you'd like to see, just let me know, and I can certainly follow up later. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.